when you start your own business, you have to have a dream. Years ago, some people say, well, dream. There's a lot of people that are dreamers. Yes, you have to be a dreamer. If you're not a, a dreamer, you don't have a dream from what you want to do and how you're going to do that, you will never succeed. You have to love what you're doing. So that's rule number one. Once you got that together and you thought about it long, you have to have, to have a product of an idea that is going to be competitive and better than anybody else who's doing that because most things are already there. So in other words, you want to be in the food business and you want to sell hamburgers, you've got to have a hamburger that tastes better, is better, and attract customers. Otherwise, do not get into the food business. And it counts for the real estate business as well. A lot of people have made mistake of getting into businesses, and then when it doesn't work, they gave up. So first of all, one of the famous things is to say, do never surrender, do not give up. But if you have a product of an idea that did not work, then maybe it's not so bad to stop and try something new. And that's what you call entrepreneurial spirit. So there's three, four different forms of getting into business. You can be a good executive, and you can be a very good manager, and you can be a very good entrepreneur. Running a Canadian tire store, for example, doesn't make you a good entrepreneur. For that, you have to have qualifications to be a very good manager, for, uh, follow certain formulas uh, that they tell you to follow. They tell you how to advertise, they tell you what to advertise, they tell you how to price it, they tell you how to fill the forms in, from all the stuff that they want you to sell in their store. This counts also for running a, a, a McDonald's. You can have 10 McDonald's, you can make a lot of money, you can become very rich. But that does not mean that you are a very smart entrepreneur. You're a businessman. And if you then make all this money by owning Canadian tire stores or McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chickens, and you start using this money because now you think you're really good. So now you go and branch out in other things. And most of them who have done that have lost their fortune because they get into other things and they think that everything works the same way. It does not do that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurs in business. And that is just having the idea, execute on it, have a business plan, and then go for it. And then the thing is find the money. In today's market, that is going to be a little bit more difficult than it was the last 10 years. But doing it with money from the family and friends, or doing it from financial institutions, and that is the toughest way to start from scratch. I started from scratch. Starting from scratch and having an idea, and starting with zero sales. Nowhere, no idea where to go. You get in the car, you say, I'm going to sell something. Now, where are you going to drive? And what are you going to sell? And why is your product going to be better? And you really have to start them with a good business concept. And that is tough and that is hard. But the joy of succeeding is, 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 is much nicer than taking over an established business. Now, both can be very interesting. There's also businesses that you can buy, and I have bought existing businesses from people that had those businesses for 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, through families, but you add them to the business you're already in. And some of those businesses sometimes you buy, and you can find that you can add a lot of value to those businesses, because those businesses were managed very well, but over the years and through the generations, they get tired. First of all, because the founder, he had different ideas than the successors, the second, the third, or the fourth generation. And sometimes they got lucky and it worked well. And in some case, in the Netherlands, I bought a 75-year-old hotel company which was totally ripped, stripped, and torn apart. Just because of the family that was running it at the end didn't care. All they cared about how much money they could take out. Tell you, I bought it for a dollar, so I mean, I shouldn't really complain. Sold it nine years for, <laughs> sold it nine years for a lot of money. Uh, and, but the thing is, th 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 that was the opportunity that was there. Nine great locations downtown Amsterdam, 780 rooms, a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars, a lot of revenue, a lot of cash flow. But you have to be able to have the discipline to run this as a business, and that was not the case. So the, the company was really stripped. It was worth a dollar, and then I still had to try to keep the bankers away because there was so much money out that that was an, an, a stunt in itself to try to make it survive without having to go through a receivership. Um, so there's different forms of how to get into business and different forms of what to do in business, and, and how to build that successfully is to stay focused, uh, execute your plan, don't try to do all things at the same time. That doesn't mean you cannot have multiple business interests as you grow and as you have money. But if you have that money and you want to allocate it towards other interests because you think you're too restricted, like I felt too restricted in Atlantic Canada. I loved it here, but at a certain time, 
uh, I outgrew the place because otherwise you get too much of a uh, control and too much of a monopoly and you have no liquidity. And the biggest thing in business to survive is liquidity. And anybody want to ask about that later on, I can tell you all about that. Because if you're not liquid, then a recession like this, and it is from my recession number seven. Seven. But this is the, the, it is, this is the mother of all mothers. It is the big one. And it is the financial, and the Canadians got away pretty lucky, actually. And, and the Canadians don't really know what happened in the rest of the world. They, they've been exempt of the pain and the financial disaster that hit the global markets in October 2008. Because we were this close to a total meltdown of the financial system in the whole world as we know it. And if it was not for stimulus packages and bailouts by banks and governments taking over banks, we would have to start all over again because it was over. It was point set match. Um, I lived that in Europe. And I say, Canada, we have a minister of finance and a prime minister and a, and a cabinet that did pretty well. I mean, because in the United States, when they have to bail something out, it would be on the, it's in the Senate committee hearings and, House of Representatives, and we blasted over CNN for about a week, but that time the whole world is scared. Not only the United States is scared, but everybody's scared. So we stop spending money, everybody gets nervous. In Canada, we do it very quietly, because I can tell you that we put more money in the system than the Americans per capita. And you say, come on now. What they told you was 75 billion on paper the Canadian banks sold to CMHC. That created liquidity in the fall of 2008. But a lot of people missed that without any hearings, without any debate in the House of Commons, $200 billion line of credit was made available by the Bank of Canada for the Canadian five chartered banks. Is that, is that good? I think it was phenomenal. Because now everybody thinks the Canadian banks are the best banks in the world. They are better than the Swiss banks. Everybody say, hey, you Canada, terrific, great banks are in Canada. I should sort of send some of my money down there. I say, by all means. You want me to take it with you? So the thing, is, the thing is, Canadian banks' reputation went skyrocket high because of that. Now, we still owe the debt as well, but we didn't create fear, and fear is the biggest thing in business. As a businessman, but also as a consumer, we cannot live with fear. We live with fear. And, you know, you may think what you think. It was done backroom politicians. Uh, but it, it, it cost this country to do very well, so much that even our Wildest expectations of being stuck with a thousand unsold condos out west in Calgary and Alberta, we sold over 550 this summer because it's business as usual. Mortgage money flows, people can buy houses. And as a matter of fact, I thought I had to write more off. No, I have to book a profit. I was almost not used to that anymore in the last year and a half. But, so things change very rapidly in each and every different market. Um, but to stay then focused and do not panic, and that's what we did in our business, and I can only use those things as, as a comparison. We, and we operate in different countries. We operate with real estate in seven different countries, and with our industrial group in another 15 countries. So that is 22 different countries that we actually have business interests. And I'm later on going to talk about that, about internationalization, and how to deal with that. Uh, the role of leading human capital development. Now we just came back from a management uh, uh, meeting, and we had it planned for Montreal, but it was so damn cold in Montreal that I made a change a week before and called everybody and said, <laughs> we changed location, we go to Barbados. <laughs> so uh, at least I had some sun and some golf in down there. It was the best management meeting we had in years. We have every year the kickoff meeting in January and then we have later on one in the fall. And the thing is that it was very interesting. I was in PEI for a New Year's reception like we had one in Halifax about 10 days ago, or two weeks ago, and we had one in PI, and Robert Gist, the Premier of PI, was there, and he had that day a cabinet shovel. So he still dropped in and said, well, it's just a busy day, newspapers, cabinet shovel. Well, we are shoveling our cabinet too, our management team. And that's what you have to do. And we look at it every year, we look at ourselves and say, what is the best guy and the best man for, for the job? That means that you sometimes have to move people across the country and the continent. Um, this will happen in our company too, because changing times, uh, you have to make changes. If you don't want to change while the world clearly has changed, somebody will do it for you. So you want to do that yourself and you want to stay in charge, then you have to do that. Now, your human capital development. You have to invest in people. Um, this company that I built over 40 years has people worked there for 25, 28, and almost 30 years. Um, our oldest employee just turned 91. 
and um, uh, he's full employed, full time, and he was sitting there, and I think you were there, Colin, and uh, I got him at the front of the reception with his wife, and I said, well, we have a new company rule, we just decided that, if you pass 90, you're still here, you can't retire until you're 100. So Leona, <laughs> he's not coming home yet. So the thing is that the, uh, um, you invest in people, and then age doesn't make a, a, a big play. We have a lot of people that are now getting to this age of 65, 67, and they like to go on a few more years. And I think they have the spirit, and I think they have the knowledge and the background to do that. I'm even planning on moving some people in that bracket across the country and say, you pack up and you go down there because I need you down there. And that's because we invested in those people, and we invested in education. Um, while I might have been a dropout, I still believe that you should have a chance to educate people. Um, I did it the hard way, not really call the, the street smarts maybe. Um, but that works too. Um, but the thing is, we have sent people to uh, just have a, a mature, a guy I took away from Fairmont, and he worked for Fairmont in, 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 in France, in, in the hotel in Monaco. And to hire him for the job we wanted, he felt a little bit inept. So he just finished his executive MBA at McGill University. So we as a company allow even people at a later age uh, to say, okay, if you feel that this will help you in your job, then we will take the time and as part of your, your, your first couple of years in here, uh, you, you do whatever it takes to do that. Uh, so we have always invested heavily in the people we have, in educating them, in changing, and changing the times. At this moment we're going to a total new computer system in our industry called Yardi. It means people have to be trained. Uh, people come over from other countries to train those people, but also your whole system changes worldwide. And we all got to go to one universal system because everybody had his own little thing. And ultimately in a consolidation that was costly and, and, and took a lot of time. The insight into the international expansion. Um, yes, we have a company that started uh, small in the Netherlands. Uh, then basically it was a small company when it came in the early 70s to Canada in 1972. So 69, so we were only a few years old and then we came into Canada. So our biggest growth we really had from Nova Scotia out. Starting in Stella Nova Scotia on 4th Street in 1972, we moved I think in 74 to the big city of Halifax and had our first office on, on Holly Street. And that to me was then a big city because from, from being in Europe in big Amsterdam, coming to Nova Scotia, getting used to small town Nova Scotia, I kind of liked that kind of life. Um, then Halifax looked already big again. Um, and then we started our business to expand in Halifax from an import and export business and get into the real estate business. But ultimately, if you're an entrepreneur and you have ideas and you think your ideas work or you think you're delivering a service that is better than other people do, and you have ideas about even how to improve upon that, then you want to sell that product, you want to export that product. So that was New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island. Then we skipped Central Canada, for whatever reason, I don't know, the opportunities were out west. So we went to Calgary, we went to Edmonton, we went to Vancouver, we went to open offices in Vancouver. So in all those places we opened offices because we believe if you're in real estate, you cannot own real estate as an investment unless you're very rich, and I was not rich. And the thing is that, uh, you know, I had to borrow money and I had to pay the bank back. And I'm not going to depend on somebody else doing that. So we always believed in having a totally integrated company where we have a certain, certain volume of a uh, portfolio of retained assets that justify us being there. And from that position out, we feel we got into the development and construction business. And that has worked. That concept worked very well from here to Moncton and Charlottetown and then Calgary, Edmonton and Vancouver into the United States. And why we maybe ended up in the States is what I call opportunity. You go where the opportunities are. And that was the savings and loan crisis in the United States. The previously big financial disaster after the Americans exported and they made it a global thing. But at that time it was just the United States only. Um, so that brought us into Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Seattle, uh, buying half finished buildings and finish them off. There was a lot of opportunity. We were quick, we were fast, and we knew what we were doing. And we had excellent people around, surrounding us. Um, then you say at a certain time, this is very well, you do well, you make money, and you want to spread your risks. You shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. So exporting that same uh, principle of how to run a business in real estate to other places brought me back to Europe, to my country where I was born, the Netherlands. And from there you branched out in other countries, Germany, uh, Switzerland, and the Baltics, even Eastern Europe. And, and that is basically an international expansion uh, based on the same principles as we are actually doing things in Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. Um, insight into the, uh, that we just had, the importance of the entrepreneurial and innovative mindset. Yes, you have to have, like I said, a real plan. And 
follow through on that and execute that. And what is the mindset from an entrepreneur is a little bit like almost an inventor, an inventor of ideas. He's going, sitting at home, scrubbing things down. That's what I always did and always had ideas. They were always very enthusiastic. And sometimes the next morning they got all killed when I came to the office and say, you're crazy, it ain't going to work. That's what I heard more in my life, though. And if everything that they said wouldn't work, I wouldn't be speaking to you here today. I'd probably still be flipping hamburgers in Amsterdam Airport. Um, that is basically the, an anecdote that I tell you right now that really was printed in the Montreal Gazette when we were working on a takeover in Montreal from a publicly traded company called Alexis Neon. And ING was my competitor. ING is that bank that is now in trouble. Um, <laughs> Who, uh, who is not only a bank, who's an insurance company, the biggest leasing company, and gambles with your money also in real estate speculation around the world, and could say that they were the biggest real estate guys in the world. No longer. Anyway, they had a 20% interest, and a journalist called me and he said, Mr. Hamburg, you came in from the back. You're the last guy into this takeover fight. There were three or four people fighting for this company. Another Canadian company called Connemar, a REIT in Quebec, and ING, and there was an American party as a kind of a hedge fund. And um, we came in from behind, and he said, what do you think that you can take on a giant like ING? So I fell the figure, yeah, what can I tell you? I said, well, if I was worried about it, I would be flipping hamburgers in Amsterdam Airport. So he thought it was such a, because that's where I used to work. And I used to flip hamburgers in Amsterdam Airport. So this was an anecdote that made the newspaper. That's what I'm trying to say. You, you cannot be scared. You got to know what you want and how you're going to do that. And the innovative mindset is that you have ideas and you collect ideas and you write them down. Even when I used to jog and did long distance walking, uh, like 200 kilometers, 50 kilometers a day for four days in the Netherlands with 23,000 other, uh, 23, other people that obviously were, now I don't want to say dumb enough because it's a crazy thing to walk 200 kilometers, I can tell you. I did it for seven years raising money for the children's hospital. So there was a reason why I was doing it. And you know, at the end, I decided this, you cannot do this anymore. This is crazy. But I did a lot of thinking. And it came up with a lot of good ideas. And then the idea is to have a dictaphone with you, a dictaphone next to your bed, a dictaphone in the car. And that's what I have, because some of those ideas, they're really good. You're really convinced that they may work. But then the next day you forgot about them, or you don't know the exact details anymore. So I think that is in real estate, but in all the other things that we did, and we did a lot of things in the area of uh, financial, and up to, at the moment we're doing things in Europe that are totally new in the area, now the banks are slipping about how to deal with mortgages and having a platform where we're going to do uh, a huge amount of mortgage business. We do right now 100 million a month of mortgage business, but the whole market is like in the Netherlands alone almost 80 billion a year on mortgage financing. So if we feel we can get 20% of that, that will be 16 billion on mortgages. But it's all low fees, low fees, low fees. And it's through a platform. So banks, they can't afford to pay for all this stuff anymore. They think it's too expensive. So you get a platform, you get banks and insurance companies to be part of that platform. You set the rules and you actually use the internet. And you use the feeders called uh, um, intermediaries. And the, and the intermediaries are licensed by the Dutch Central Bank, otherwise they're not allowed to sell the product. And that are your people that are selling the product, actually. You just supply the service. And that's purely where, at the moment, in the financing situation, the way it is, the banks are letting things fall, you pick it up. Insurance business the same way. We have done a lot in the area of insurance business. We have done a lot in the area of self-insurance. And what was self-insurance? We went for self-insurance because certain products and certain things we could not insure, and if we insure them, they were very expensive. So expensive that we say, this is crazy. I'm talking about director's office liability insurance, leasing insurance, and all the things, and you have to then have an entrepreneurial mind. We find out, obviously through some good accountants who gave us advice, they say, Barbados. Well, I like the sun, I like the weather. The golf is pretty good. So you have down there what you call captive insurance companies, you have IBCs. So we formed 25 years already ago in the captive insurance company and run a pile of international insurance business through the Caribbean. And we also do our forex contracts through the Caribbean, uh, through Barbados. So that's what I'm saying, trying to get from in your own business and try to do as much as you can, try to make the whole product, not half a product. You can assemble things, or you could say, I'm going to make it all myself. And then the margins in the business will increase. Now you can only do this when you get used to uh, the product that you're selling and the product you're making. The same thing as I used to renovate buildings, old buildings in Halifax and Dartmouth, fixing them up, rooming houses. I mean, first you got to clean them all out. That was a job in its own. You would not believe that I walked around with uh, brass knuckles. I did. Because some of the stuff that lived in rooming houses 
I wouldn't call upstanding tenants. So collecting was, a, was an art, but getting them out was an art too. So that was, that was a tough business. In those days, you were everything. You were, the, you were the guy that had to clean the building. You had to renovate it. You had to throw the old furniture out. I was the greatest demolitioner. I, had, I was very good with the big slash hammer. And I loved to drive the bobcat and bulldoze everything down. <laughs> but the thing is, and building, I really didn't know that much about. Till I bought in, in a company in, in, in Nova Scotia called Jay McDougall & Son. That was in the apartment building business. And, and we carried on under the urban, uh, multiple urban development program uh, in the 70s building some, some, some apartment buildings, two and a half story walk ups, not too complicated. I thought I'd get a hang of that. That's good stuff. This is nice stuff. And from there, you then carry on. You're not going to build the first time you get in the construction or development is a high rise for 20 stories because it probably will fall over unless you use very good people. So you got to learn a lot of things and you have to attract a lot of people along the way in doing this. And I'm talking about 40 years of my life before I get there. So, and I probably have as much fun now as that I had then, because then what I did, I had a lot of fun in doing. Um, the, um, how to diversify core offerings. That's basically what I already was talking about. Your core offering is the, the thing, the business, the main business you're offering. How are you going to expand on that? What extra things that you can do? And that is even in the area of simple residential living, okay? What do you do? If, if, first of all, everything we built for residential rentals, we built with the idea that people might want to buy this home one day. And in Europe, that is more ha happened than in North America. So you make a better unit. You make a unit, you make uh, things that you offer to people that the financing will be available. Uh, you, you add services to it. You may insure them. When they buy, you also can offer them insurance. Uh, you know, you don't want to lease them a car, but actually for a while in, in Halifax, we had a leasing company. We had a lot of tenants that not only rented from us, and they leased a car from us, they bought insurance from us. So it's selling more than just this uh, uh, renting this, this apartment. So we were not investors, we are operators. We were entrepreneurs, business people. And, and, and so, well, because some people say, are you an investor? I said, well, maybe the name Hamburg Invest for the parent company or for the public list company is actually the wrong word because we do not invest. The public invest if they invest in our company. People that buy our bonds, people that buy shares, and people that will invest in our company and lend us uh, money, that are people that invest in us. But we are not investors, we are purely operators. We're not sitting down there for the flip, for the fast, for the fast buck. Um, the organizational culture and structural changes during expansion. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I mean, especially the times that we have right now uh, are very interesting to see how people deal with that. Because you will have people that you will promote because you think they're ready and they're good. You have other people that really think that they were owed the job but you think you simply cannot do it. So in, in an organization, um, how can you deal with the structures and the changes that, that go on all the time? Because you've got to change almost, uh, as soon as something happens in the world, you might have to make changes. And if you have an international organization, even more so you have to look at, uh, you cannot say status quo, this work, you're the vice president, you're the CEO, you're in this thing for me, and you know, you're going to be there for the next 10 years. It's like, I compare it sometimes in Holland to a good soccer team. Okay, you have talent, and it's called a selection. You have 11 people in the field, and you have maybe seven, eight on the bench. The seven on the bench are also very good. They're all eager to get into the field. So if, the, if you're in the field, and you do not perform, your chance to be taken out that you go on the bench, and the other guy is being put in. I run my business actually the same way. So the thing is, always have some extra people, and especially in financially, Bad economical times. Many times I've been told, let some people go. Pay the layoff. Give me a year's salary. Give them six months or whatever it costs to get rid of them. Okay? But we get rid of the cost. And I've never done that. I always said, no, guys, I'd rather have two guys on that job because he can also get hit by a train, he get a heart attack, and then I'm really lost. At least now I have two people sitting down there. So we always were a little heavy on the top, heavier than maybe needed for the size of our business and, and the different locations. But it also gave me the comfort that uh, uh, if something happens tomorrow, uh, that people can step in. And then I come to the point now that we hired one gentleman, and we hired him for a purpose. He came out of another industry that we really wanted. And that's the guy that took the executive MBA. But why did we hire him? First of all, I knew the guy for years. Uh, you got to like somebody if you put him in senior management. But he spoke five languages. He was born in the Netherlands. He's fluently in German, French, English. So this guy is from our Canadian head office out, he now is in Montreal, works from our office in Montreal. Out. But I can send him tomorrow to the Netherlands. I can send him tomorrow to Germany. And he's willing, with his wife and kids, 
to pack up and do that because he has done that so many times. He worked for Fairmont, so he, he ran the Bourgeois Hotel in Moncton. He was the deputy manager of the uh, Chateau Frontenac. Uh, he ran the uh, Little Bay Hotel in Barbados. That's where we met, so obviously you, you understand I spent some more time in Barbados. Um, that, that, that was not the first time. Uh, and we met there, and, and, and then you have a click, and you really think this is the guy that can do this stuff. So then they transferred him from Fairmont to, the, to, to, the, uh, to Monaco, and he became the manager of the, uh, uh, the Grand Hotel in Monaco with Casino. So there was a guy that, that dealt with unions, dealt with a lot of people in the hospitality industry. What is that to do with real estate? Well, in a way it is, because even a hotel is real estate. And we own hotels, and we're building a new hotel in PI right now while I'm talking. Uh, the biggest hotel in PI, the newest hotel in PI, the highest hotel, the highest crane ever in the, in the islands. And it will be connected to the convention center, and you all should go down next year. The most expensive hotel. Uh, so don't think you're going to get a bargain. Um, but, the, but the thing is that so the hotel, all of what I'm talking about in real estate, we are in the shelter business. We supply a roof over somebody's head. And it is commercial, residential, industrial. Uh, as well as hotels, and hotels are part of real estate. So while this guy might have been really a guy that had his education uh, at Disney Corporation and at hotel school in the Netherlands, you got to turn him into a real estate guy. And I guess you have to then be uh, willing to spend a few years to a senior executive to convert this guy to that function and to understand that. But then the reason, and that's what I try to explain, we took this guy for all the other talents, because we talk in this country sometimes about speaking two languages, we think that's a big deal. Well, in Europe, a lot of people have to speak four or five languages. That brings me to the point about how do you deal with that international expansion. Do not go to a country that you do not speak the language or do not understand the culture. Two things. But if you still want to go down there, because sometimes that's the way, that's the way it goes. I went to China in the early 90s, and I went to the University of Beijing and took some lessons in Mandarin Chinese. And the only thing I can say now, ni hao. Um, but, but it was not, I thought it very tough and rough, but I hired a guy. And I hired a guy that from the Netherlands out, because you want to have some of your own people in there. And he had a degree in, uh, at the University of Leiden in Mandarin Chinese as well as Chinese cultures. But when I drove with him between Beijing and Tianjin, where we were developing an industrial area, uh, he was talking to the taxi driver. And the taxi driver didn't know what he was talking about because the written script is the same, but there are so many different dialects. So then I showed him how my Chinese worked. So I patted the taxi driver on the shoulder and told him this. He understood we had to turn around. Then I told him, and he understood we had to go to the airport. <laughs> then I told him halfway we wanted to eat something. So in the end, I, I let this guy go because it's all his studies. <laughs> he couldn't get me even from Beijing to the airport to the plant that we were building. And I paid this guy a lot of money. So that's why I'm trying to say that education does not mean everything. Um, we, we actually moved out of China. We, um, I can tell you this, uh, that is one of the countries we lost the most money we ever did. And it was also not borrowed money because no bank would lend you money in the early 90s to go down there. I came there around the time from Tiananmen Square. You could have a little book from Mao. I still have several of those. And I thought this was going to be it. I thought I came to Canada. This was going to be it. Now I'm going to do China. Because I was full of vinegar. Let's take China on, right? <laughs> but anyway, it didn't pan out very well. Uh, I have a lot of accumulated tax losses that I can use in the Netherlands under some kind of a, uh, agreement between uh, China and the Netherlands. So I'm still burning up tax losses from those days. Um, uh, but it was a kind of an experience. So you can learn from that. But I learned from that that uh, going to another country, um, the language, and if you don't speak the language, have at least somebody who is fluent of came from there. And we did that later very successfully by going to the Baltics. Um, and we hired people from the Baltics. Some of those people came to the Netherlands, went to the university, the Business School of Amsterdam. They worked for, first for our office in the Netherlands. After they were fully trained and knew how we worked and what our principles were, they became the person to open up an office in the Baltics. And they still commuted between those different countries. We told those, those people, some of those people we even sent to Canada. We sent them for three months to Edmonton, three months to Calgary, three months maybe to Montreal and give them a good education, and, I mean hands-on, inside education in how we think our business should be run. And then I think you can expand wherever you want to go. And culture uh, is a big thing. I mean, doing the wrong thing in a country uh, at the wrong time doesn't make you as a company very successful. It doesn't matter what your, your great ideas were.